presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, what does Idaho need to create a vibrant filmmaking community? We talk with two Idaho filmmakers who are enjoying the success of their latest work and trying to help other artists. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. There's no clear thought being exercised right now in the American public. The conversations I had with him were, were e e explosive. I would imagine it was not too dissimilar from what some people feel when they talk to the Dalai Lama. He was warned in, in jail that his family could be in danger, you know, the way he's carrying on. I burned the American flag as an act of protest against the injustice that is being extended against all of the people. We burned the American flag because it has been desecrated. And it's the only proper way to dispose of the American flag after desecration is to burn it. And then the tragedy hit. I don't want to say that the FBI kills innocent kids and children. I just don't want to say that. But you never know. I died then. I had to die in order to get through it. All through the course of the years of all of this, all I did was talk, <laughs> you know? and they cracked down hard just for that. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. The clip you just saw was from the documentary film Trudell, which will air on PBS next month. The film, which takes us on a journey with Native American poet and activist John Trudell, was a labor of love for Idahoan Heather Ray and her husband, Russell Friedenberg. All in all, it took 12 years to make, but it was well worth the time. Since the film premiered at Sundance last year, it has toured around the world and recently opened in both New York and Los Angeles. And as I mentioned, it will air on the PBS series Independent Lens, Wednesday, April 5th at 9 p.m. Mountain and Pacific Time, and Tuesday, April 11th at 10.30 p.m. Mountain and Pacific Time. And I'm delighted to welcome filmmakers Heather Ray and Russell Friedenberg to Dialogue to talk about their work and the filmmaking scene in Idaho. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. And one note, because this is a tape program, there will be no call-ins. Well, first of all, congratulations. Thank what, you. What an incredible effort, and uh, I'm excited that it'll be on, on PBS. That's just wonderful. We are, too. It, we think it's a great broadcast home for the film. Heather, for folks who don't know about John Trudell, can you give them a kind of a mini bio of him? Well, um, John is originally from Nebraska. He's Lakota, Santee Sioux from Nebraska. And um, in his early 20s, actually, he was going to college in Southern California, and that was when the Alcatraz occupation began, um, which he very quickly became a part of. Um, he was one of the leaders, so to speak, of the occupation, which was a 21-month occupation. And, um, and I think that for him and for many Native people, that was really in some ways like a birth. I mean, it was a turning point. It was the first significant event in the 20th century. And we're going to show Native a clip people. from that in a moment, but he has gone on to become uh, a poet of the spoken word. And a recording right? artist. And a recording artist. Now this journey, uh, this film journey, to document his life started way back in 1992 when you were only in your 20s. How did you come to find John and his story? Um, I came to know him first through his recordings, namely these early recordings that he did, um, which was just his poetry with traditional Native music. And um, I had been exposed to those through my travels in the community and, and was a, you know, a filmmaker and was so affected by his ability to put language together and represent ideas, I think, that resonated very deeply with many people. And you're part Native American yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What tribe? Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And then you saw him in a cafe? I saw him at a show that he did in Santa Monica and um, was just so struck, you know, that I had the opportunity to meet him. And so after the show, I approached him and, and asked him if he had been interested in the possibility of collaborating on a documentary film about his story. And others, kind of big guns, so to speak, had been interested in his well, story, yes? Well, consequently, he was approached, this, this, his manager at the time was approached the same week by D.A. Pennybaker and by Ted Turner. Um, 
which was an interesting coincidence. Uh, but it was right after the film Thunderheart came out, and John was in that film. So I think that there was, you know, he was in the zeitgeist, in the, in the zeitgeist and people were interested in who he was. But he chose you. He did, and, and I, you know, I, who knows why. He says that for him it was really, he felt like my ideas were the closest to what his ideas would be. Now, Russell, at some point during this process, the two of you met. Yes, we did. Fell in love. <laughs> yes, we did. Um, what attracted you to this story. Heather's already said she's part Native American yeah. and she had heard his recordings before. Did you know about John Trudell? What attracted you to the Actually, um, Heather and I met at the 1999 Sundance Screenwriters Lab when she was actually working. Uh, she had created the Native American program for Sundance and I was actually a participant in the lab. The writer's lab was a fellow. And shortly thereafter, I believe our second date was I was introduced to John Trudell. So by default, <laughs> I actually had no choice as to whether I was going to be involved or not. But it's been an incredible journey. Um, at that point, Heather had already been working on the film, shooting John for, I believe, a period of almost eight years. And <clears throat> John's involvement historically had gone back uh, probably another 15 years prior to her actually shooting him one-on-one. -on -one. So when I came on in the process, I was looking at over 25 or <laughs> some, 25 some odd years of historical footage. and. Did you feel uh, like an interloper? <laughs> oh my lord! You know, it was it, it was an incredible process to actually come on working on as my first documentary. But in a way, Heather, um, having your husband be involved is a pair of fresh eyes. And he's a writer. I mean, he's a screenwriter by trade. So, uh, as he just said, it was his first documentary to take on as a subject. But it really made sense because the story is very complex and covers a, a great deal of time. And he was able to actually take the material and help us see into it and find a structure find the through lines, um, historically speaking, and, um, you know, really develop a story. Well, every great story has some sort of, a, uh, every great story, I feel, has some sort of mythological context to society and resonates with society on, on a level of myth, and John certainly has that. I mean, uh, it, it's, a, it's a story like, like Jesus' story, if you will. A, a man comes up, speaks for the masses, and is in a, in a lot of ways, is personally, it's taken down for what he's saying because it, it's so antagonistic in a lot of ways, and then rises up from this personal, from the loss of his family, which is in direct relation to his work, and comes out of these ashes and creates another life for himself that is just as resonant but on a different level, in a non-active political form, but in a form that's more about artistry. Well, you mentioned he was a spokesperson for the masses, for the American Indian uh, movement, and now others. Let's take a look at a clip that kind of sets the scene, going back to Alcatraz, some of the history of John Trudell. For more than six months, a band of American Indians has been living without government approval on Alcatraz Island the rock that uh, used to be a federal penitentiary. And all attempts to get them off have so far failed. Welcome back. This is Radio Free Alcatraz from Indian Land, Alcatraz Island in California. This is John Trudell speaking for the Indians of all tribes. And for this portion of the show, we have that uh, the government has been practicing a policy taking what they need from the Indian people, well, not necessarily what they need, taking what they want from us just about any time that they would like to do so, and they've been doing this through the years, they're doing it today. And uh, I would say that a large majority of the people out in the average, the average American people don't, aren't even aware that this is going on. And maybe that's why this, the government is allowed to get away with this. The garbage is piling up. The lighthouse is broken. But they say it's no worse than living on a typical Indian reservation. This is a country where all men are created equal, and it's the land of the free, and the home of truth and justice and liberty for all. Well, we want to know why that doesn't apply to us. So uh, if this is the land of the free, then we want to know why we don't have the respect and dignity that all free men are accorded by other free men. The government had declared Alcatraz surplus property. Young Indian nationalists, claiming an old treaty right to unneeded federal property, descended on the island one year ago today and took it over. If there's ever going to be a, a generation of revolutionaries raised, people wanting change, these kids are getting, these kids are getting good experience as to what, uh, what, our, what Indian relationship is with the government. 
another exceptional use of, of archival footage that must have been such a treasure trove to find that. When do you think that John Trudell became radicalized in this way um, against the American government? Because he says in another part of the film, he, although he grew up poor, he grew up happy. What was the change point for him? Uh, it was definitely in the spirit of, of the times. I mean, as we know, you know, the 60s and the 70s was a, was, was a turning point uh, in this country, and the civil rights movement included many different movements, whether it be the Black Panther movement, the Chicano movement, the Black Liberation Army, whether underground, the American Indian movement. I mean, all these movements were happening concurrently, and um, Indian relationships with the government were so complicated at that. I mean, they still are, but at that point in time, the you know the native community at large did not have a voice, and everyone knew that and felt it. And I think that they were all were trying to figure out how to create a voice. And Alcatraz was the turning point. Well, not only did he speak out in, in kind of uh, a context we're used to as being a spokesperson for Alcatraz, but as we mentioned, he's moved on into the spoken word. And let's take a look at another clip from your film in which he, uh, in a very, what might be somewhat controversial uh, letter to God, he, he talks about his, his uh, anger, really, against white people. Let's take a look at that. To God. To God. I hope, hope you don't, you don't mind, mind, but I would like to but talk. We would to like you. to talk to you. There are some things there we need to straighten out. To straighten out. It's about, it's these, about these Christians. Christians. They, claim they claim to be to from your nation, your nation. but man, but you man should see the see things, the things they, do. they do all the time, blaming, blaming it on, on you, raping lying, the earth, taking lying, more lying than taking the more than they need in all the forms of the greeds. They say it's God's will. I don't mean to be disrespectful, we do not mean to be disrespectful. but you know how it is. But you know how My it people is. have their own Our ways. people have their own ways. We never even heard of you until not long ago. Your representative spoke magnificent things of you, which we were willing to believe. But from the way they acted, we know you and we were being deceived. It is time for you to decide what life is worth. We already, we already remember, remember, but maybe you but forgot. Maybe you forgot. Russell, John Trudell is not afraid to make people uncomfortable. Mm -mm. No. How, what's been the reaction to clips like these from your film, which which strike strike out? The thing, the thing about John's words is they are powerful and they can actually put people off sometimes. But if you sit through John, you'll understand that he gives context for everything he says. An example, he has an issue with Christianity. He talks about the tribes of Europe having been gone gone through the same levels of genocide prior to their actually encroachment on the into the further Western Hemisphere and the North American continent. He gives context to things he's saying. John is incredibly cerebral, incredibly heady, and a very bright person. But the thing about John is he speaks truths, and they resonate with you organically. You've called him a prophet, both of you. Mm -hmm. in, what, in what sense do you feel that way? Uh, uh, well, because he's a seer. People that are prophetic in, in their language and the way they are able to sort of deconstruct society in the way it is and give it, give it an, an understanding of its roots, why we are and where we are in present tense and an understanding of the trajectory of society as to where it's heading. He's prophetic in that nature. He understands how this society that we live in, how it's fragmented, how it was formed, why, why we're here, and the genesis of where it's going. And I think that's what's important. Now, after Alcatraz, uh, Heather, John Trudell kept working in the American Indian Movement. Um, it was involved with the, in a takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. Of course, there was the incident at Wounded Knee, and then he uh, most notably burned an American flag in protest for how uh, natives he felt were being treated. And during that time, he married uh, Tina Manning. Mm -hmm. And that name may be familiar to some of our viewers. The Manning family uh, is very prominent on the Duck Valley Indian Reservation mm -hmm. in between Idaho and Nevada. And Tina was also an activist in the American Indian Movement. They moved to the reservation. But what happened to her would change John's life forever. Let's take a look at a clip. It's really hard to talk about Tina. It's really hard to, you know, it's still a, still a wound that's not healed. John at that time was in, in uh, doing his thing on the national level. Uh, they had the shootout at Algala. You know, it was still it was still a hot time. It was it was still a hot time, and things were secretive, and 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 people looking over their shoulders. Uh, where John lived, where Tina lived, was always being cased. You know, there's people saying that there were suits driving by all the time, and you know, checking it out, and 
They were always being watched. What we were doing in Duck Valley on her reservation, ser it, was, it, was, it seriously was a major thing for the system at that time because we were really, the tribe, tribe was taking jurisdiction without asking for permission. The tribe was acting like a tribal government sovereign. And there had been conflicts with the federal government because of this. You know, Tina was a target because the threat that Tina posed to them, all right, is that she was from there, she was born there, she grew up there, they knew her, they trusted her, she was well educated, and she understood their system. For anyone to think that what happened to her happened to her, as specifically something just related to me, it minimizes who she is. He was warned in, in jail that his family could be in danger, you know, the way he's carrying on. About two o'clock in the morning, my dad came over to the, he was pounding on the back door, and uh, we opened the door and he, he was just standing there, and, and what struck me was his eyes were just sort of gray, it seemed, and he had his pajamas on, and he just said, there's a fire. The house is burning, and they're all in it. There was a, there was a line of fire across the roof. You know, some people that saw it from a distance, you know, it says maybe that, you know, somebody had torched it that way. In the fire, uh, the family was trapped in the house, and uh, Tina and her children were killed in the fire, and so was her mother. The Bureau of Indian Affairs went out there and, and uh, didn't conduct a very thorough investigation. Um, I don't want to say that the FBI kills innocent kids and children. I just don't want to say that, you know, I don't think, but you never know, you know, you never know. Heather, before we talk a little bit more about this case, I just have to say that um, as a documentarian myself, when that hummingbird flew in front of Lindsay when he was talking about how painful it was to talk about Tina, did you feel that that was her spirit? Yeah, it was Dino Butler, actually, who was oh, Dino, a, yeah. an A member, and, um, a longtime friend of John's and of Tina's. And uh, it was a very um, special moment, definitely. Did you get that sense? That yeah, I mean, was... it was, yeah, because it, we were just shooting, you know, the interview, and, yeah. and that was the one and only time that, that the hummingbird came through. <laughs> and didn't ironically, didn't, didn't Dino say that? I don't know, I mean, it's... Oh, that, oh. No, she was... The FBI dossier about John Trudell is quite large, as we saw in the promos, at least 17,000 pages long. Have you seen that? And if so, is there any evidence in those files that that, that fire was or could have been intentionally set? The, the, the cause of the fire was never determined. I mean, there were a couple of investigations, one by the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they're on the reservation, and then John brought in a private investigator but the cause for the fire was never determined. It was not determined if it was, you know, a fire that was arson or if it was accidental. What does John think? John certainly feels the fire was intentional. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but there, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that represents the Manning family's feeling. I mean, it's, I think that there's, you know, a, a number of differing perceptions of what happened. Certainly the fire, though, influenced the, he has to, had to, the rest of his life. And John pretty well dropped out of the formal American Indian movement at that point and went on the road and, and has nurtured this spoken word performance. And he actually feels that his wife, his, his, his uh, dead wife, gave him so, the so-called lines mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Explain that uh, before we see a segment of the program. Yeah, and I think also to give context to that dossier being 17,000 pages, we have to realize that John was one of the few real political protesters of, of American history that never actually picked up a weapon and still garnered that much sort of suspicion around his work. Um, yeah, uh, coming out of the sort of ashes of that event, John actually, uh, out, out of his need to heal, found solace uh, in quietude, and he actually went to Canada for a period of time. And in that time, in that phase of his life, all of a sudden, these poetic lines started coming to him. And he really feels that that is his connection with his wife's spirit. And she gave him those lines as a gift, not only for him and his own personal healing, but for helping him in his work and to connect still on that level. 
Well, let's take a look at a clip of his spoken word that you've put together with video where he talks about how the grief that he felt, he turned into positive energy mm -hmm. and encourages other young Native Americans not to lose hope. I died then. I had to die in order to get through it. And if I can get through it, then maybe I would learn how to live again. Putting my love into the ground like this, putting my love in boxes, putting them into the ground and covering them up, reconnected me to the earth. I was listening to the voices of life, chanting in unison, carry on the struggle. The generations surged together in resistance to meet the reality of power. Mother Earth embraces her children and natural beauty to last beyond oppressor's brutality. As the butterfly floats into life, we are the spirit of natural life, which is forever. The power of understanding, real connections to spirit, is meaning our resistance, our struggle, is not sacrifice lost. It is natural energy, properly used. Remember the people. Remember sky and earth. Remember the people have always struggled to live in harmony, in peace. Struggle against selfishness and weakness so the people may live as nations. The old ways are hard. The people have always had to work together. Remember, impatient one, remember and live. Do not be afraid of truth. Respect, discipline, share your life so the people may live. Honor sky and earth. Honor yourself. Honor your relations. Remember, impatient one, the gentleness of time. Grandmother Moon, we love you. We pray for you, for us, and for the invader who just can't comprehend, respect, love, or the balance of life. We do not join the invading madness. From the way they act, it speaks of spirit sadness. Machine money progress is the cause of our common abuse. We see you, grandmother. We feel you. We love you. We know through your reality we will endure. We are one. We pray for you. We pray to you. And in a moment, we'll be back with more with filmmakers Heather Ray and Russell Friedenberg about their work and about their plans for the future, which include a building for filmmakers to gather. Stay tuned. And we're back with filmmakers Heather Ray and Russell Friedenberg. Your film has been screened all over the world, really. Talk a little bit about the places that it's been. Um, we've screened in, uh, I think, around 50 film festivals, or maybe a few more, actually. Um, many festivals in the United States, some of the bigger festivals, like Sundance and Tribeca, Mill Valley, uh, Santa Barbara Film Festival. Um, but we've also screened in some interesting places. We're screening in Japan in a film festival, the Tokyo Film Festival, next month. And we went to Sydney mm -hmm. this past summer. Message, um, message sticks. To a festival that was actually wow. an Aborigine festival mm -hmm. um, that includes a world indigenous spectrum. And um, we're there in Sydney. Russell went to Norway <laughs> um, to some tiny fishing town. The southernmost port of Norway, Kristiansand. You know, there's great interest in Europe in Native American culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has this film been received in Europe any differently than in America? Well, the film's yet to screen broadly in Europe, mm. and we've been doing the best we can to just keep up with what's happening mm. here domestically. It has screened in a few places in Sweden and Norway, and um, it's screening in the Munich International Film Festival um, at the beginning of the summer, which is, will be a good, you know, prestigious festival for it to launch. But um, we've also sold some broadcast territories there, and and have gotten a lot of emails from Europeans. I mean, all over. 
Well, I know when I was uh, doing some uh, work with the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, the folks down there told me that they, they greeted some people from Europe uh, who came off the plane in full Indian regalia because they were so fascinated and <laughs> speaking in, you know, Navajo or something like that. So I've actually been to a powwow in Germany. Yeah, I know there's a lot the, of interest there, over there. There's a lot of cross-cultural uh, yeah. resonance with these kind of traditions. While we're talking about where people can see your film and for folks just tuning in, let's put up the screen again for when you can see Trudell on PBS. You can see it on uh, right here on Idaho Public Television on Wednesday, April 5th at 9 p.m. and Tuesday, April 11th at 10.30 p.m. So we hope you'll pick one of those times to tune in. Now, as you traveled the country and you mentioned all these film festivals you were at, what kind of shape do you feel that documentary film is in right now? Because if, you, if you're just looking at the regular broadcast channels, you really still don't see that much of it. Um, I think that the, the state of the documentary is at a very interesting place right now because we've seen in the last couple of years uh, a number of, or at least a handful of documentaries have box office success and that's been, you know, certainly... Fahrenheit 9-11. Absolutely. Um, Bowling for Columbine, March of the Penguins, Winged Migration, mm -hmm. uh, there's been some, What the Bleep, there's been some very interesting documentaries that um, have made their mark at the box office, which is, you know, what makes sense to the industry. So there's been more and more documentaries that have been financed and made. Documentaries do very well in the festival circuit. Um, very well in terms of monetarily or, or, no, or eyeballs? No, uh, in terms of critical acclaim mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and audience response. It's still hard to make money at this, isn't it? It is, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, how did yeah. you fund your effort over a period of 12 years? How did you keep going? Well, uh, we were very lucky to have some wonderful grants funding on this, but we also had wonderful contributions from friends, family, supporters of John. Uh, you know, I noticed Angelina really Jolie in, in the credits. What was her participation? Angelina Jolie is friends with John and, mm -hmm. uh, and her brother James Haven, and they both were participating in the production end of it in terms of helping us on a financial level, and they're really wonderful supporters of John and have been over the years. Heather, though, I know there were times that they were really tough for you. You were a single mom at one point, and I, I think I read on your web that you had like $118 to last for two weeks. <laughs> so you actually so, read that? <laughs> yeah, I sure did. <laughs> production notes, yeah. So, so you know what the struggles really are, and I'm sure you, you know how to encourage other, other people. Uh, embarking on this journey. Well, you know, the thing that's great about documentaries is that you can you can do them over time and you really can just have a camera and some sound equipment and a good subject and just set out and embark on the journey of making the film and it's different than a dramatic film which really requires sort of crew and cast and, you know, a, a, a larger structure. Um, I also think in some ways, and I would just, it was on the jury at Sundance, mm -hmm. the documentary jur uh, jury, and I also think that documentaries in some ways can provide more interesting subjects. I mean, they really, I say this, you know, Russell and I joke about this sometimes because he's a writer and there's certain things that happen in life that you say, right. you couldn't write that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just is right. uncanny how life, you know, plays That's itself right. out. I That's mean, why reality shows are so popular. Absolutely. I think documentaries are a direct uh, correlation their popularity to this phenomenon that we call reality, reality TV. Shows. Really, these personal ethnographic stories, people are interested in what's going on behind closed doors, you know. You mentioned that you were a juror at Sundance, quite prestigious, one of only five documentary jurors. Um, and I understand it didn't take very long for your group to come to a consensus on this year's winner, which was called The Lost Boys of Sudan, a very lushly filmed uh, project about following several boys from Sudan as they came to the United States. Is that correct? That, that yeah, it's all a film you... called God Retired of Us, um, about these lost boys um, from the Sudan. And it, it was an interesting jury because it was quite a diverse group. Um, and in the end, we there was just a very strong consensus about the winners. We also gave three awards to a film called Iraq and Fragments, made by a Seattle filmmaker, James Longley, and um, agreed immediately on which films should receive you know the awards that we had to you know decide about. And and we actually decided in about 15 minutes, and then <laughs> took another half an hour to make sure that we were sure. <laughs> 15 minutes. We decided in 15 minutes. i got to talk to the group about what the secret is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that film, the, the God Grew Tired of This, which I have seen, and it's it's wonderful, um, has very high production values, and in fact, was bankrolled in part by Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. um, so d does that mean that smaller films that don't have that kind of 
money behind them may not be as successful because they don't look as good? Not at all. I mean, if you look at the Oscar nominations this year, a film like Street Fight, which is a small documentary, first-time filmmaker about a film, uh, about a, you know, a mayor race in New, York, New Jersey, I mean, it's a very low production value and, um, you know, it was definitely made from the hip. And I think there's a lot of films that were made in that way. Mm -hmm. If uh, uh, people want to see these documentary films, though, just in their daily lives, it is hard. I mean, unless you can pay to have HBO, um, of course, there are some films on PBS, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But um, both of you are involved in something called the True West Cinema Festival. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. That's to bring some of these films to, to local audiences, such as Boise. Yeah, we both sit on the board for True West, and it was something that we were asked to be a part of um, not too long after we moved here, actually, um, uh, two and a half years ago. And it's a film festival that is entirely organized by filmmakers locally, including Gregory Bain and, and um, Travis Schwartz. And it is a, it's, it's a great idea because part of what True West does is celebrate filmmakers and subjects from the Western United States, which is not something that other festivals have done. So it has this kind of built-in identity or branding that really celebrates the West and gives a voice to the kinds of stories that emerge out of this, you know, this part of the country. Now, both of you have just purchased or are purchasing a building here in Boise, and uh, your offices will be there, but you have kind of a larger vision for what that uh, place called the Muse, is that right? The Muse Collective. The Muse Collective will be. Yeah. Russell, why don't you explain that? To well, the Muse Collective at this point is sort of a, a really wonderful group of about seven artists and, and healers who are, we've bought this building, we're in negotiations to finalize the purchase of this building, which is, is now the sanctuary downtown mm -hmm. for the homeless. So it has wonderful roots and in, in, in artistry, I, I like to say, because I think the homeless really give us a voice in a lot of ways for where, where, where we are as a society. And uh, this would be a, a cumulative group of artists, filmmakers, a, a creative cooperative, if you will. We're going to have a post-production facility there. We're actually going to be editing films that are by local filmmakers, and we're actually going to have our offices down there. So it's really exciting, both in, in the pre-production and post-production way. Of, Why of did filmmaking. you decide, Heather, to come back to Idaho? Um, you're, you were born here. You grew up in Idaho City. Um, but you've worked in L.A. As you mentioned, you work in Park City at Sundance. Why did you come back home? Well, Russell and I had been in Los Angeles for a long time working in the industry. I was there for 16 years, and he was there for close to a decade. And we had reached a point where we were finished being there. We had, you know, our third child and felt like we wanted to change our, our environment and our lifestyle. And also, we'd, the industry had reached a point where it wasn't, it's not necessary to be there. Um, so much of the film industry is done through the internet mm -hmm. and, and the phone and, you know, really the film festival and market circuit. So we knew that we wanted to leave Los Angeles and Russell's from New York City and I'm from Idaho. And when we sort of weighed those options out, we realized that... <laughs> and your family said what, Russell? Yeah. <laughs> uh, where's Idaho? Well, we realized that we wanted a yard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a place for our children to come up in, in such a way that, you know, we could live um, a lifestyle that, that is more reflective of our, of our ideals. And, um, and the stories that we wanted to tell, too. And I think that with the onset of technology, you're lo really looking at... I mean, George Lucas said today, he said the blockbuster is dead. With the onset of these new technologies, filmmaking is really become in a lot of ways a cottage industry. What does Idaho need to nurture its filmmakers more? Well, part of what it needs is what's already happening, which is a, a collective spirit that has, you know, come together. I mean, it's been it's always been here, but we've seen it sort of burgeoning over the last few years where the film community is coming together and people are collaborating and um, there's been a number of independent films that have been made. There are many more that are in development. Um, there's some work that's being done at the state level with this um, legislative package, creating an, you know, an incentive package for um, productions to come and shoot in the state. Talk a little bit and about that because some of the um, independent filmmakers in Idaho were a little saddened that the threshold for that bill for the, for the sales tax exemption is that you have to spend $200,000 over a period of 36 months in order to qualify for it. Do you still think that that is that's a, a production? Number? That's a production, a budget level that makes sense for the state to do this. Um, it has to, it has to be economically viable for the state to, you know, to um, agree to it. And, and that's a, that's a level that makes sense. It's also a standard budget level because it's, um, you know, the, the Screen Actors Guild contracts, the SAG contracts mm -hmm. for independent films. That's what 
one of the contracts start at two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then they go mm -hmm. from there. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a budget level that, that makes sense. Piece of legislation. I'd like to, as we close, bring this back right around to John Trudell again and show one more clip from him where he speaks about the issue of uh, authority and power and where he sees things going right now in the world. We live in a time where we have been indoctrinated to believe that authority is power. So when we look externally and we see these, that, these ones that would feed off of us and control us, they have, they have defined power from, from the material perception, perception of the human, not of the being. So we look at economic systems as being power, but in reality, the, it, an economic system is basically a, a system of authority. And we look at military systems as being power. But in reality, that's another system of authority or religious systems. But these are systems of authority. But, it, it, but we have been programmed into believing that these things are power. And because we have really no influence in these things, no, no real accessibility to these things, and if we believe they have the power, then it doesn't say much for ourselves. So power really is about our relationship to life. And Heather, speaking of a relationship to life, I know that your father really was a source of power for you in that sense, that he, he was the first to put a camera in your hand mm -hmm. when you were, what, 18? Uh-huh. And your project, your next project, or one of them, is to document his life. We've been starting to develop that. There's, we have, he's passed away since. Um, I actually have two fathers, um, both of which were a, a tremendous, had a tremendous influence on me as an artist. Um, and we've been in the process of documenting and pulling together material that I collected over the years and sort of looking at the way in which they, re they represent this kind of spirit, you know, this, these two original Idaho men who um, were very close to the land and very unique as individuals and represent something, a face of Idaho that maybe most people don't really recognize, kind of that old-time spirit. I think that's one of the things John was trying to sort yeah. of contact, give context to there is that these memes, these, whether it's economic systems or political systems, they rise and fall. But the earth is forever, and our, and, our family. and family, and our attachment to those personal relationships in the earth are, are sort of the resonating message for where he is. What's next for you, Russell? You're working on some other projects as well. Yeah, I have a, a, a western that's sort of a, a, ma a magical, mystical western that uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Julian Goldberger is directing that Heather's producing. And Julian just had a film uh, that in dramatic competition, 06 at Sundance, called The Hawk is Dying with Paul Giamatti. Um, I have another smaller film that we're shooting here with Greg Bain, who's a director, who's editor on Trudell, called Ibid. Uh, it's <laughs> a small, fun, fun, wacky film that we're doing here this spring. So yeah. And Heather's so multi-talented. I saw that you as an actress in, in the movie Christmas <sighs> in the Clouds. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, as we close, I'd like to hear from each of you what you hope people will take away from the film Trudell. Um, I, I would really hope that in terms of the, f the beyond the message of the man and just in terms of the film that, I, that they would uh, glean that this is a, is a work of labor of love from on Heather's part for mostly contributing 13 years of her life to this man and his message and that the film resonates with them on, a, on an organic level so that they're left not actually contemplating on an intellectual level what was said, but actually resonating with them on an emotional level, understanding it organically. And Heather, what do you hope people take away? Well, I would really, I would hope that people have an understanding of who John is because he is a historical figure. I mean, he's still here, obviously doing what he's doing, but he did make a mark in time. And I would hope that this film. Um, represents and celebrates that and also really gives a voice to the community the native community at large and the you know the native people's movement um, that was very active during the 1960s and 70s and beyond and had a tremendous effect on how we see native relations in terms of policy um, rights and education and and really you know I, I would hope that it represents the community I'm sure he's pleased with the film I think he is. Yeah. Well, I'm pleased to have had both of you here 
for this discussion, Heather Ray and Russell Friedenberg, filmmakers. And again, I want to remind you when you can see this film, Trudell, you can see it on our air, Idaho Public Television, Wednesday, April 5th at 9 p.m. Mountain and Pacific, and also Tuesday, April 11th at 10.30 p.m. Mountain and Pacific time. And as usual, thanks for tuning in to this ed edition of Dialogue. We hope you'll join us at the same time next week. Good night. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho.